Finance and Audit Committee um, meeting on November the 2nd um, at 3 o'clock. It is uh, now 3.02. And I'm going to read the statement of announcement. A meeting notice announcing the date, time, and place of November 2nd, 2020 Finance and Audit Committee meeting was distributed October 30th, 2020 to appropriate media and other groups or individuals who have requested notification. The announcement and agenda were posted at the Department of Disabilities and Special Needs Central Administrative Office and on the website. The public has been notified that accommodations such as interpreters, mobility assistance, or other assistance will be provided to individuals with disabilities and special needs if requested in advance. The uh, next item is the adoption of the agenda. Can I get a motion to adopt, adopt the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Second. Or you can second. Go ahead. Okay. Um, ag uh, agenda is adopted as presented. The first item um, is reviewing the minutes of August 6, uh, 2020. In, can I get a motion to approve those minutes that had been updated um, prior to today's meeting and, and shared based on, I think, a request by you, Barry? Um, so can I get a motion to approve the minutes on for August 6, 2020? So moved. Yes. Okay. S minutes are approved. Second. Okay. Minutes are approved um, for August the 6th. We also have a copy of the October 12th, 2020 meeting minutes. Can I get a motion to have those minutes approved? So moved. Second. Okay, minutes from October 12th, 2020 meeting are approved. All right, item number five on our agenda, capital <coughs> review, project review approval, coastal electrical grid, Chris uh, and Andrew. Sure. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask Andrew to step up here in a minute, but I, um, initially I'll lay some groundwork. We, um, in, in our capital budget, we actually outlined um, the grid at Coastal Center as needing to be uh, placed in our, our budget for this year. We, we have actually two grids that we're needing to replace, one at Midlands and one at, at Coastal, but the Coastal one's a, a, a newer one. And so little did we know after presenting that capital budget that we would have a transformer or whatever it is that, that blew, and I'll let Andrew speak to that in just a minute. Uh, so we, we've got uh, at our coastal center an electrical grid issue that we're trying to deal with right now. And I'm going to let uh, Andrew speak to the grid and where we are, and then I'm going to uh, update the committee on our recommended uh, course of action in regards to the situation. Andrew, if you can step up here, I'll move and let you have the mic. Um, thanks, Chris. Yeah, just to give a little bit of details on what we're dealing with at uh, Coastal Center, uh, the el existing electrical grid is owned by DDSN. Uh, it was installed in uh, 1966, so it's currently 54 years old. The um, Underground electrical lines on campus are only rated for 40 years, so we're pushing 15 years past their useful life expectancy. Um, so uh, the the system is is from, you know not in good condition. Um, it's old equipment is is is, phase, is phased out. You can't replace it anymore. Um, the plan is to update the system up to current code and then hand that system over to Dominion uh, Electric. And um, we, we're waiting on a proposal from them to kind of handle their portion of the work. Uh, they would take it from uh, their connection now at the substation to the transformers uh, that exist around campus. Uh, we would have some additional work to run that to the buildings um, and to, to basically update the entire campus. Um, so uh, recently, some repair costs that have come up recently. Back in April, we, we blew a transformer out there. I think we paid about 35 thousand dollars to replace it uh, and then as Chris mentioned this past Friday or a week ago Friday uh, we had a, a big circuit breaker at the substation that blew up 
um, it caused a, a fire there at the substation. Everything blew oil all over the place. But um, and that's I think we put a picture of that in the in the material there. So that's what you guys are looking at there. Um, we're we're getting that replaced. Probably about an estimated cost of about fifty thousand, but should have something in writing uh, by Wednesday this week. Um, but this uh, you know the um, uh, with these. Uh, these uh, breakdowns that we're having, we're, we're kind of in a position where we've got to go look for, for spare parts um, and, and rely on refurbished things out there on the market to, to kind of piece things back together. Um, this circuit breaker blue, it, there, there's two of them there at the substation. The system's kind of set up like that for this very reason. Uh, so we had a high voltage contractor on site that, that is now running everything through the, through the one existing circuit breaker. Uh, again, it's designed to do that, but it's never run like that before. So um, at Coastal Center now, we, we essentially really do have all of our eggs in, in this one basket and, and keeping our fingers crossed that it does not um, you know, fail as well. But uh, trying to get it repaired and then move on with uh, the bigger grid replacement project that we're, we're looking at here today. So any questions? Yeah, just hang out for the switch sheet seats in case I need you again. Anybody have any questions for um, Chris and Andrew on this? Pretty much uh, that one breaker will carry the load. They have, they're not experiencing any problems. They, they're not yet. It's only been running like that for about a week now. They were probably a week and a couple of days. Uh, again, it's designed to carry it, but it was designed to do it back in 1966. Um, it's just never operated like that before. So it's, uh, it's just not a good position we're in. So. So when do you anticipate the other one being back online? They, they've actually got uh, got the replacement breaker there on campus now. They've got a high, high voltage contractor looking at it now to see what he's got to do to, to hook it up. Again, expecting a quote to do that by Wednesday this week. So they're, they're actively working on the repair now. Um, well, and finding parts to this system is like look, looking for a needle in a haystack. And if you didn't catch what Andrew said, Often we have to use refurbished parts, not new parts, because they don't make them for yeah. this system any this, longer. This refurbished uh, breaker we just found, I mean, it's a 1980 uh, breaker, uh, and that's upgrading from our 1966 breaker. So, you know, either way, we're still dealing with old old stuff. Right. And so, as you as you well know, uh, with the folks that we serve out there, it's very it's imperative that we maintain reliable electrical. Um, capabilities uh, even with generator power that's out there it's insufficient to carry any long term it's not designed to carry long term loads and uh, most of the generators don't operate the full electrical capacity needed it's just geared towards uh, short term minimal things running uh, so we're really in a situation where we have to accelerate this it was already on our radar um, in fact when Joan Cooper was here, there was a proposal from SCNG uh, regarding Midlands and Coastal. And then when I got here, they had just uh, had Dominion, since they took over, uh, repriced the project. And um, we're looking at about $800,000 for their part. And then we've got a lot of other additional pieces we've got to pay for, uh, such as professional fees, which we've included uh, some of that information in your packet. Uh, as well as actual running of, I, I guess this is where I have to hand it to you, but yeah, there's well, a lot of things yeah. that has to be done from the grid to the actual homes. Yeah, Dominion pretty much takes it from the existing substation now where we where, where our ownership takes over. Uh, they'll take that, retrench all the under underground uh, wire around campus and, and reset the new transformers. And then it would be our responsibility to take it from the transformer into the building. So uh, we'd have some... some additional work on top of what Dominion is planning to do. Quick question. All right. As a contingency, is there a mobile unit if push comes to shove and it becomes necessary? There we do. Yeah. We do have a mobile, mobile generator on site, but it's not uh, long term solution. Yeah, it is not it's something that you want to rely on. Um a lot of the buildings aren't wired to accept it. Now even if you did get the buildings where they were wired to accept a, a portable generator um, even then, you know, you, you'd want a more long-term solution than, than relying on generator power. I'm, I was only thinking as a push come to show. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think, situation. yeah, I mean, I mean, this this circuit breaker could fail this afternoon, and, 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 and you know, we're in trouble at that point. But so. that, would, that would be catastrophic for us because that generator would only supply power to one dorm. We have 10 residential dorms. Nobody can hear you, Rufus. 
Which is they can't hear you. We can, but they, but yeah, the Gary and Barry can't. can't. Okay. <clears throat> I was responding to Commissioner Miller's comment about portable, uh, portable generator. We have multiple residential units, so a portable generator, which we do have, would only supply power to one dorm. And so if there were a failure in the, in the the existing breaker or another transformer, that would be catastrophic in that we wouldn't have the emergency capabilities to power the entire campus and where other individuals live. And we are looking at, um, you know, alternatives that we have to evacuate or move folks. Um, I know Rufus and his team have been looking at, looking at that just in case. Um, but this is what we call a CPIP product. This is a, a current improvement project. And so this has already been through, if, if Andrew can speak to phase one and two, um, it's already been through, I guess, JBRC. No, this has not been, this has not been gone downtown for approval at, at all. Uh, oh, that's now, after phase two. No, the Midlands project has. Okay. Uh, we're we're, we're going to have the project downtown, you know, this week. We, we got to final the, get the A package finalized and send it down, down there. But um, uh, no, it'll, it'll have to go through JBRC who meets once a quarter. Um, for, for, for final approval downtown. That's so. joint bond review. Yeah, joint bond committee review. Committee or something. Um, and so what, there's a process we have to go through. Yeah. So we're, as far as our, we're stuck in the, pat, we're stuck here right now for a little while, but our, our guess, our, our thing is to kind of explain to you the process and then to make sure that you guys are, are on board and understand the need to fund this project. So we're expecting the total project to run about a million and a half um, is that right? That's our late 1.3 to 1.5 million. Yeah. Now it all depends on what Dominion comes back with. Now their prior proposal, they were covering about eight hundred thousand dollars of the construction costs, but we paid for that in different ways. Whether we had some uh, yeah. some responsibility with some upfront costs and monthly costs after that, you know, they they proposed it in several different formats. Yeah. Um, really, what we were we were definitely set on though is is the the about five hundred thousand dollars in additional costs uh, for our portion. And so currently we have uh, $1.3 million sitting in our holding account, if you will. Um, that's just 2.3. Uh, some of that's earmarked for other projects. So basically we fund this checking account, if you will, and it stays there. And as we get uh, projects funded, we transfer funds downtown to the state and then they hold them uh, and pay bills out of that once we've opened these projects. So we've got $2.3 million in the account right now. Uh, we owe the account $1.5 million for last year. It was in our cash flow uh, numbers because when we report our cash to the committee and to the commission, it's, it's un, you know, it doesn't include our, our construct, our permanent improvement dollars. And so we already had the $1.5 million in our cash flow that we reported to you in June. Uh, so we've got to send that actually down there. So that gives us 3.7 in the account. And then uh, this year we're hoping to put at least two and a half, get back into funding it on an annual basis, which has been a while. Uh, and that's about two and a half million dollars a year that we can fund into this plant project um, or into this account on an annual basis to, to keep up with our, our CPIP uh, needs. And so, the funding is available. It's just a matter of prioritizing this project ahead of others that may have been on our agenda for this year. Um, also accelerating it a little bit um, from where we had anticipated this landing. And so what I'd like to do now is ask the committee to ask us any questions you need to approve us, I guess, submitting the the, yeah, the submit the A package and, and then also uh, authorizing uh, Mr. Joe Land, our IDC electrical engineer, to, to move forward on his, his phase one design portion of, of, the, of the construction. Which work. is $57,000. It, it, it's the, the first proposal, the $8,900. 8600 Yeah, 86 Okay. So. Does um, anyone else have any questions on the call? Went on the line. I have a suggestion. You know Leo Lane. Leo Lane? Yeah. Sure don't. No. Yes, sir. I move that we go ahead and um, and fund this um, because we don't. I mean, obviously, we don't have any choice. So um, I, I just make a motion that we go ahead and fund it and move on. I think for, um, for the initial fee that we need to do. 
Commissioner Miller, I think, was having a asking a question first, Barry. So let me. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, I would just, Andrew, I would recommend that you call Leo Lanes. Okay. But he's over all of Dominion when it okay. comes down to get him to along there. Yeah, he may have uh, a temporary solution that just tell him that I, I told you to give him a quick call. I sure will. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. So um, there are no other questions. Uh, Barry made a motion to um, approve the proposal that we were presented with today for the engineering services phase one at $8,600. Um, can and I get a also submission of the plan? Um, once we submit, we're obligating that we're going to have the money to fund this project, right? And yeah. that part of the next step. Yeah, and we're saying that we're going to do this project within two years. Uh, so they okay. they kind of hold us to that as well. Okay. So um, the second part of the motion um, is to give approval to submit the plan um, for the work to be to be done on the power grid conversion, which approximately today is $57,200, correct? That's the total uh, consulting fees. It'll, right. it'll probably be, you know, about, about a half a million dollars in our portion of, of work by the end. Okay. All right. So can I get a second? Because All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Right. Um, any opposed? Okay, there are no oppositions, so uh, unanimously approved the um, the motion. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, Next item on the agenda: internal audit charter, Kevin Directive two seventy five fifty five DD. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this was presented to the full commission last month. It had to go out for its 10-day uh, public notice, which ended Thursday, close of business. And um, we only got uh, one provider sent in some comments. Um, I hope you all got what I sent out yeah. this morning. Uh, sort of minor. There was a capitalization error. Appreciate their um, pointing that out to us. And that was on um, page one in the first paragraph, second sentence, where it was agency service providers. And then the second <coughs> public comment was on page two under authority. Uh, looks like maybe in the uh, sixth paragraph, carrying out their responsibilities. And I'm paraphrasing here, but basically the concern was that paragraph says that internal audit will have full, free, and unrestricted access to DDS and service provider organizations, activities, records, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what this um, comment was trying to say is we have several providers. DDSN is really a small slice of their revenue pie. Um, so ethically, they do they have contracts with uh, Department of Mental Health, Department of Social Services, DJJ. Ethically, we would never walk into one of those providers and say, hey, show us your records for the programs you're running for DJJ. But just to clarify that, what we were recommending was that we would just add one word in that uh, paragraph and change it to DDSN funded service provider organization, just to make it clear that yeah. we're limited to what DDSN right. is funded. Okay, makes sense. All right. So, um, anybody have any questions? Um, um, I think we have to make uh, to approve these, right? Is that? But what do we have to do today with these? Uh, I think you need to approve this, and then it needs to go back to the commission this month. Hopefully, because <laughs> we've been beating this horse. So hopefully, yeah. <laughs> for uh, approval, and we will get it issued. Okay. So it'll be yeah, the re the rest of it should be ready. The rest of it should be ready for this month, right? I mean, the, your audit and and the um, I mean, th this entire document should be ready now with this small, slight change, right? Yes, sir. Well, then, Absolutely. No, no, no. All right. I make a motion that we change that we make that slight change and and ha and have it at the on the agenda for the for the November meeting to be approved. All in favor, Nothing. say aye. Aye. And no questions. Um, anyone have any other questions? I just want to make sure. Okay. 
So motion is approved to um, make the correction um, on the um, the directive and present at the full commission for approval um, this month. All right. Thank you very much for that. And the next item, uh, external peer review costs from Kevin. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. It was mentioned um, in the commission meeting last month about checking on cost. We talked about peer review, our, our external peer review at the last commission meeting, how you can do that, have it done. Uh, you can do a control self-assessment or you can have an external party. Commissioner Rawlinson had asked about getting information. Uh, remember, we are not due for this until October of 22. Um, but I did contact the Institute of Internal Auditors to get costs from them. They will only go out 12 months, so this could change when the actual time comes around. Um, but I actually uh, asked them to give me two different uh, prices. One is for them to come in and do the external assessment where they do everything. That cost is $27,600. And then I also ask for a, uh, if we did it like we did last time, if we did a self-assessment and they just sent in an external party to validate that self-assessment, that cost is 14,800. And this of course is just for information, and yeah. we'll share this with the full commission um, at the next meeting, but just wanted to let the committee know. Okay. Any questions? I'm good. I don't have any questions except to say that it, it was, that when you bring it up, you might want to say that it, that it was that I think it was clear that that we wanted to do the full one instead of the partial one like you did last year. Um, but I mean, I can say that if I need to in the meeting. But I would. But that's that what Stephanie Stephanie definitely had in mind. I can I think from the meeting. But but moving on, we can bring this up in the meeting. Really. All right. Sounds good. And, and officially take a vote possibly on the fact that we want to go that route as a commission. You know, peer. You can peer. Understand, pricing may change because. Right. But right. Right. Yeah. You could say moving forward. Yeah. This group coming. And then um, I think you and I had spoken about kind of building out a calendar for what it would take. Once we move that route. We did. That's on my agenda. Okay. And, uh, we had our um, Friday was our report on applying agreed upon procedures due date. So. Okay. Those have been coming in as Brian will attest. Either those are extension requests nonstop. So we've been busy with that. But yes, I am familiar and I'm going yeah. to you that. And then I sent you the information you had asked for with regard to uh, risk yeah. assessment. And, uh, right. Okay, great. Um, all right. Well, thank you for that. And uh, we'll move down the agenda to HHS administrative contract update from Chris. All right, well, this is in the vein of just trying to keep everyone up to speed on what we're doing as an agency to work through this admin contract situation that we inherited. Um, I know this is a long time coming, and Mary is probably going to want to speak up to this since we actually talked about it this morning with, with uh, Baker and his team. Um, basically, there are two components to the admin contract, the backwards-looking uh, contract that would, would be, which is a weird date, October 2014, which our fiscal year starts in July, so it's a strange start date. I know that aligns with the fiscal federal fiscal year, but um, but then it ends on the, our fiscal year of June 2020. So uh, we've got that particular contract, which is, uh, and again, I'll let Mary speak to that in just a minute uh, as to how we, the path forward there. And then the, the one that really matters is the one that, that's going forward. Uh, June 2021, which is this year through June 2025. So it's a five-year contract. And um, what we've done is we've been working really hard to estimate our administrative costs, not only at our existing level, but levels that we feel we need to be at to be successful. Because as you can imagine, we've let a lot of things atrophy and it's where we are cost-wise is not where we need to be to be successful. So. Um, they they reviewed all that and had no issue with it. Um, basically, what we've got right now in front of us uh, is a waiver only administrative contract. It's for Haskey, CS, and IDRD waiver administration. Um, what we're trying to do is get clarification in regards to the other Medicaid services that we administer and how we're going to get paid for those. 
um, but the vast majority of our contract services are and costs are in the waiver area. So um, while it's not 100% of our revenue, it's 62% of our of our activity. So it's the largest portion. So we will still work to get uh, the ICF community uh, residential contract because we're looking at passing through full rates on that. Uh, so we're not going to be in a split rate with that uh, soon. Uh, case management, early intervention, and Greenwood Genetic Center, and the other administrative, uh, the other Medicaid programs that we administer. Um, the thing with the admin contract is uh, we estimated seven. This isn't our full administrative costs. There's we can have a whole session if you want on how our admin costs are handled here because it's kind of kind of crazy and uh, different. Uh, but suffice it to say, that there's 17 million dollars of total administrative costs that's allocable to the waiver, and we would get 50 percent uh, FMAP for that. So we would split it 50-50 with Medicaid and they would remit to us that eight and a half million dollars. Now the catch is we have to get out of split rates with our providers. Right now we bill a certain rate and we pass through a certain rate. And sometimes those pass through rates are actually higher than our billable rate. And so that if we start splitting that rate, the providers will actually lose money on those rates. So there's, there's a lot of nuance here. Um, we also have a lot of rates that are not the same in the different waiver programs, although the services are the same. Uh, but we have to get out of split rates back to July, which means that we have to go back and compute all of the money that uh, the difference between our HHS rate and what we effectively pay our providers and retroactively pay them all those funds. Um, and, and again, this is a pretty in-depth area, but but again, in general terms, this is actually advantageous to DDSN because in our split rate environment we're in right now, we're actually either upside down on some of these rates or um, due to how um, the uh, vacancy allowances and different utilization rates that we are uh, having. Let's talk about case management, for example. If you look at case management before we pass through those rates, we're losing what, 300,000 a month, Pat, is that right? And so we went fee for service and passed those rates through. Uh, so it, prior to passing those rates through, DDSN was incurring over $3 million in annual losses paid with state dollars. And we have similar situations with different service lines like SLP1, Job Coach, and some of the others. And so as we move back to split rate, get out of the split rate environment, um, it'll actually be advantageous for our providers and for us the way that we plan to implement this. Uh, we would also get reimbursed quarterly. We would bill them quarterly. And then at the end of the year, we would have to file a cost report. And this particular contract would still be a two-way settlement. So what that means is if our admin costs actually exceed what we anticipate them being, they'll write us a check. Um, conversely, if we don't incur all that cost, we'll have to write them a check. So we've got a lot of built-in fault tolerance here so that as we move through and things get more complicated and we start up in our game, uh, we're able to ensure that we're made whole in regards to our administrative costs. So with that being said, I was gonna let Mary speak and Pat, because I know Pat probably has something he wants to add to that as well. Um, did you wanna no, I comment? Was, I was just gonna tell the commissioners I'll be sending you a document um, probably well before the, the next commission meeting, uh, the contract that goes back to 2014. Um, just wanted to get some assurances as to the reason that we were able to sign a contract like this that went, it was looking back versus looking forward. Um, basically, it's an assurance that says that these are the things DDSN has been doing for HHS. We just want to document that. So um, we'll be getting that to you and a cover letter by Director Baker for you all to see. And our understanding is there's no fiscal impact to that. Yeah. It's just getting so a document. This is, the, this is what you were doing for all these years for, for HHS. Um, <laughs> and quality assurance and, and, um, of, the, of the programs and the programs that we did run. So. Um, I will get those contracts to you 
I would think it probably by the end of this week. Oh, contract. It's just one. Then will he be at the commission meeting or not? Well, he's going to try to get that on his. Okay. So if you all have questions, you can ask him. Okay. I didn't know. Okay. I like him to speak for himself when we're talking about HHS. I feel better yeah, that way. Yeah. So I did ask him this morning if he would um, attend the commission meeting. So now it's just a matter of getting on a schedule. Okay. Pat, do you have anything you want to add? Before I open up? Okay. Anybody have any questions on this for today? Just to reiterate, you said we save three million dollars a year going to fee for service for case manager, right? Correct. And in the in the providers, I, I don't know that that's what we ended up saving per se, because there were some billing. You know, as our providers have gotten more um, efficient in their billing, the actual uh, billable services and the level of services have gone up significantly. So we have to match those increased bills. And so that's not what we ended up saving in the end, but that was the billing inefficiency in the system at the time. Um, whether that's our current savings or not, I haven't analyzed that number. But what it really turns out to be, Barry, it's, you know, we were paying $3 million and not really getting a service for that money. Um, well, what has happened is the amount of contact with families and folks being, um, having someone that they can get a hold of has increased because now yeah. they have that contact. So the service is better for it. The service has increased and we're saving money. Yes, that's yeah, right. Right. If utilization goes up, we'll be spending more money, but it's for a reason. The service is being rendered. Right. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. All right. Well, then uh, we'll move on to the next topic if we're no other questions on it or comments. Okay. Item number nine is PPP and other COVID funding communication. All right. Well, I know this has been a hot topic and, you know, I, I kind of really waited way too long to get this guidance out. Um, it was just so confusing and trying to wrap my head around where we need to land on this thing. But um, I did provide each of you, you should have in your packet, the uh, five page memo that went out. Um, it was issued uh, on October 19th. And then after it had been issued, we I meant to send it out as a draft. That's what Pat had asked me to do, but I failed to remember to do that. So when I sent it out on the 19th, we get, did get some provider feedback that I had a few calls um, and from an auditor as well. And so after hearing those, those concerns, we, uh, I reanalyzed my position as it relates to provider relief funds and FEMA, not PPP. Um, I'll speak to PPP as a separate topic, but Provider relief funds in FEMA are geared towards paying for specific COVID-related increased costs such as PPE, lost revenue, um, you know, ion filters for your HVACs, you know, all these things that, that providers could incur as an additional cost that we typically would not pay for in our contracts and they would not typically budget for. So we, we reissued our position on that, and that's the memo I've provided to you today, uh, is the revised version where um, they've got to validate that these expenses are allowable and outside you know, their normal budgeted items. Now the PPP, as far as I can tell, we have 15 DSN boards that received this money. Um, I can't tell the exact dollar amount yet for each of their loans. Um, but assuming, because they only give you a range when you download this from the SBA, um, I'm assuming an average of a million and a half, which I think is, is conservative. You're looking at $22.5 million of loans sitting out there uh, that concern us. And so it, it was imperative that we land on a, a decision in regards to how the providers could spend these PPP funds. One thing that we did not want to do is get into the PPP regulations because they're 
ever-changing. We don't control them, and that's not our place to deal with federal those federal regs and those programs. Our position was we have to protect our cost settlement process and our rates because we are in the middle of a rate setting exercise. Um, and to have all these costs disappear out of the system really jeopardizes our ability to continue to justify higher residential rates. Um, so it's multi-pronged um, in our response. And so basically what we have said is until you fully expend our money 100%, for each contract area. So um, let me give you an example. If I have an early intervention contract and in that particular area, I took a loss and I fully expended DDSN's funds plus any other local dollars that I was coding to that department, then you can start tapping into PPP subject to PPP rules. Um, and again, we did not get into that. Basically we said you get here and once you clear this hurdle, then you can start considering uh, using PPP. Um, so I think we've landed on good guidance. It wasn't overly popular. Um, a lot of folks feel like they should be able to, I don't want to say a lot of folks, at least two agencies expressed uh, that they thought they should be able to fully fund their reserves, their 10% funding, which no, I mean, that's not what PPP is for. PPP is for excess cost over and above what you're funded and how do you make an argument that you made 10 percent and lost money at the same exact time it's just not a winnable argument so um, or a position to take so that that's where we landed and in this memo there's a lot of guidance as to how we want this property reported in our audits and in our cost reports because absent that we're going to get the kitchen sink and honestly i feel like even with this i'm going to get the kitchen sink because what I've learned is even though I issue guidance and try and get this stuff out there, it doesn't make it to the auditor all the way or, you know, they, they don't care enough to read it or whatever. I don't know what the reason is, but I fully expect when I get these, these cost reports and audits, I'm going to find they didn't read or didn't follow it, what we asked them to do. So that's just part of the, part of the risk there. But just want to let you all know that that's where we landed and I'll be glad to take any questions. We did have a meeting with the providers on October 29th at four o'clock. We had 68 people on the line. Um, we had very, very few questions once we presented our position. I think there were one or two questions. One asked about how about the 1% interest rate? Is that an allowable cost? I said, you're going to have to go back to your auditor um, consult GASB or FASB as well as PPP in regards to those rules. Um, and I'm trying to think uh, the other ones about funding the 10% surplus. Um, but outside of that, we didn't receive any questions. So hopefully, hopefully we put all those concerns to rest. I just have one question, Mark. On these loans, if they are called, what's the obligation uh, as as it relates to DDSN? We have no obligation zero in regards to the loans being called. Correct. That's in writing. Well, we have we're our, they're all their own legal entity, and they have to fill out the loan paperwork without any. We don't attest anything. We don't sign off on anything. Um, it's just as if they went to a bank and got a loan. We wouldn't be responsible for that either. In state law, um, it indicates that DDSN is not uh, on the hook for any local provider's debt. It's actually in, in the law also. Okay. Good question. Well, I don't have any money, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so this document basically takes up for the for the for the schedule schedule you were going to create and, and have them ask if they got money or not or what, what's going on with that schedule yes it went out with the schedule it should refer in here that they have to fill out a document I didn't have a, you didn't i didn't have it sorry i didn't have a chance to read the five page document it wasn't here till one o'clock and or right around there and i and so i didn't get a chance to to look at it before i got on here but much except to say that it was there i did get it but i haven't got a chance to look at it close yet but yeah. But anyway, that, I, this takes up for that. So we're moving in that we're moving in that in that direction to get this resolved because we got to make sure they don't double dip. I mean, that's, that was the whole point from before. 
it, it, in a sense, we do have a liability because we got to make sure they don't double dip. And that, and that is correct. And there was a schedule that went out with this memo that I failed to send you because it was in an Excel document and I didn't think about attaching it. Uh, but it clearly asked them for all the different funding that they've received or anticipate receiving, where they got the money from if it was a PPP loan, the loan amount, and then if they're claiming costs, they have to give us all that detail by program, where those costs are. All right. Now, I apologize, I just sent it to you. I was waiting for final approval in-house to get this out today. So the, the providers actually just re received this as well when you did. Okay. The, the revised version. Okay. All right. Um, no other questions about this. Move on to. Okay. So we did add uh, a mandatory slash highly recommended auditor training requirement in our audit directives. Uh, this past year, and, and Barry, when we, we looked, and Robin too, actually, I just know Barry has a lot of strong uh, feelings about the audit directive that we have to work through. Um, we, we added it uh, that, that that was a uh, recommended auditor training, and we need to determine if we need to make it mandatory or not. We are getting a pretty good participation level. I know the DSN boards, most of their auditors, I think, were, were present, um, but now we're doing uh, this this round, you know, our, all of our DSM boards are June 30 year ends, and so we did that training in April or May, Kevin. Hmm? In May, okay. Um, and so, what we've got to do now is come back and catch all these private providers that have September 30, December 31 year ends, March 31st. Not everyone has a June 30 year end. And so we've set up two sessions that are going to, it's going to, there will be a lot of content that will apply to DSM boards as well, uh, but its primary focus is going to be the private providers because they are very different. There's a lot of nuances when we deal with that group. Um, so on November 16th from 2 to 4, uh, we are offering auditor training in December 3rd, 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., we have offered the commissioners to attend that. If they would like to attend, just let me know. and We'll make sure you know we get you the link. It's uh, you know part of our goal is to really increase the quality and the accuracy of the products we're receiving uh, to make our jobs easier and more reliable um, data when we when we try to utilize what what's been turned in. And so we do have those those sessions set up. We probably will do another one back probably around February. Uh, for for December year ends that that miss this because a lot of times folks aren't thinking about you know audits until they're <laughs> like right around the corner or they're working on them now. So did you have any comment, Kevin, about the training? Right. Yep. Your mic back. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that update. We'll move to the next item: cost reports update. Okay. Um, 2017's cost report was being worked on when I first got here, and of course, I was swimming. I, I didn't know hardly anything that I was looking at in regards to the state's cost report. Although I've prepared provider cost reports for 30 years, the states is quite an undertaking. Uh, so anyways, we've been working uh, collaboratively with Myers and Stauffer, who was engaged by HHS to complete 17's cost report and 13, 14, and 15. So 17 really should have been, the goal was to finish it last August. And so what's happened is basically as I've learned more and got and researched more and got more involved in the cost report, the more errors and issues I noted. Um, and so then, as I noted these issues and went back to provider cost reports, I realized providers were messing up their cost reports. So I had to basically recreate a lot of the work. And again, we're talking 2017. Normally, 
we would kick that back to the provider and say, look, fix your cost reports, but this is old data. So um, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And now that I know what I know, <laughs> We, we have been working on it diligently and we've had so many revisions and iterations. We finally have a final cost report. Yay, celebrate. It was issued Friday or Thursday of last week. I don't anticipate having any further revisions. There are some very small things that I know are still wrong with it, but we can't seek perfection at this point. In fact, I told Jeff Saxon this morning in our meeting with HHS that I need to get with him because I know there are a couple things he needs to be aware of when he completes his review, but we should have the 17 cost report signed and sent in this week. So that will be done. Um, after aggregating that data, um, and again, I've back to trying to validate a lot of the stuff I've inherited. What you do is you compare your allowable costs to your revenues that you generated over the same period of time. So. As I looked at the, we have the cost side now because the cost reports are done, but as I look at the revenue side, what I have determined by check, testing a couple of these programs is that the revenue we're using are actually what was deposited for that fiscal year, not what revenue we have for that year. So in other words, it, it's blind to what the actual underlying service dates are. So. We put in the bank $13 million for case management. Well, that's not the number you're supposed to compare to. You got to look at the actual underlying service dates. Um, and so I've got to go back and look at the revenue, but I don't think it's that far off because you're talking about, you know, accruals and backing stuff out and adding things in. But at a very, very high level, we've got about $48 million in excess cost in the system. That, that we see right now. And again, that number can change, um, but it's huge. That's a lot of unfunded cost. In that $48 million is about anywhere from 18 to $20 million of other post-employment benefit liability accruals and unfunded pension accruals. Those two accruals have always been told by my predecessor that they're allowable cost and that providers should put them in their cost reports. And they also will get counted when we do cost settlements. Well, that's actually incorrect. And so what we've got is a bunch of cost reports with all this unallowable cost in it. And 2020 cost reports that we're getting should be getting in the house any day now. We've told all our providers, get that out of our cost report. So we've done a training and given them a variety of, of um, tools, if you will, to address that. But um, just looking at all the audit reports and computing what I think that number is that's built in our cost, it's 18 to $20 million of, of that 48 is, is really non-allowable Medicaid cost. Um, so that still leaves us with $30 million that we're paying out in excess and our providers are incurring um, in excess of what we get funded. So when we tell you in all the commission meetings that we have a revenue problem, this is what we're talking about. And Mary and Pat and myself and Rufus and lots of folks have been trying to fix this issue and it starts with getting the right rates with Medicaid. Mary's one of her things she loves to talk about is all the residential outliers are 100% state funded. Why don't we get that in a rate? And actually Josh asked that this morning, like why they don't, why don't y'all have a rate for that? <laughs> so, that's what we've been talking about. You know, and that's $7 million a year. Yeah. So um, anyways. With federal match. So um, what we did today was to show that there was except extra cost in the system that was before the increase in our, I'm talking about the providers, talking about our residential rate. Remember, we only get paid one residential rate for all of our residential programs from HHS, and we pay out in excess of what we get back. So the, closer, the higher we can get that residential rate, the more even break even we are. Um, I don't think we'll be close to break even, but at least we'll be generating some additional funds in the system, which means we can then raise rates without asking for more appropriation because we are utilizing the money we already have to match uh, the federal funds. 
Okay, and then, and then uh, 2013 to 2015, 2013's cost report is well underway. Um, in fact, we've been engaged with Myers and Stauffer for a couple months now trying to answer their questions and give them additional data. So 13 shouldn't take nearly the time. You know, part of the issue is I was learning, Myers and Stauffer said we have the weirdest, craziest, and they do cost reports nationally. They were just appalled at how involved and how crazy we are as far as, they just reaffirmed everything, you know, you've heard as far as how crazy the DSN system is. Um, and then mid project, we lost the their CPA that was working on the project, went and took another job. And so we had to work with the whole new team um, on our cost reports. So there are a lot of things going on there, um, but we don't think 13 is going to take very long at all. And then right behind that, we have to get 14 and 15 done. Um, we have a lot of the data with them already. We just haven't started working through the questions yet on that one on those two. Now, cost reports are due November 30th after the year's over. So June 30, 2020, we're supposed to have cost reports to, to HHS by November 30th, 2020, which is the end of this month. Um, of course, we're way behind and they're least worried about this year than they are those old years. They want us to really catch up versus because I asked them the question, I said, do you want us to focus on keeping up or the ones that are past due? And they said, work on the ones that are past due, you know, with the goal of getting current. Um, so right now on DDSN, uh, HHS is paying Myers and Stauffer for 13, 14, and 15. They are not paying for them to do 18, 19, and 20. That's on us and in the future. So as we build our capacity and our capability to do our cost reports in-house. Uh, just a little background information. That lies in the cost analysis division, which is under Debbie Wilson, who's our director of accounting and contracts in the back of the room. Um, her entire cost analysis team was has turned over. So Chuck Norman left, Casey, she may be on the call. She's with Babcock Center now. Uh, Donna Johnson retired and then uh, Yi Hong is no longer here. So we've had four out of four in our cost analysis division gone. Um, so we've started rebuilding that. We, we've hired Diane Welsh, who's been here, what, about three? She started in June. She started in June. Um, Andrea Hodges, she just started last month or this in October. And then Matthew uh, Coburn, is that his last name? Just started today. Um, and so we're rebuilding our cost analysis division. Um, we also have, that's still only three out of the four people. We have, we have placed to add for a cost reports full-time person um, because the issue is we need somebody dedicated to this in-house that this is their primary job because you have such a compressed period of time when the audits show up in September and cost reports. You only have a month and a half to two months to do the entire cost report. <clears throat> so there's a lot of work that has to be done from July 1. You can't sit around and wait for the cost reports to come in. We have to do a lot of data and things internally for our piece because um, our costs get aggregated with the provider's data. So we have to do our own internal work. Um, so we are advertising for that. We've got 40 plus applicants, but none of them are uh, what we're looking for. Uh, so we've got to add out on Indeed and now LinkedIn as well, trying to find this person. Um, and so hopefully we'll get them on board. But we've also uh, contracted with Chris Lagord. I don't know if any of y'all have been around uh, long enough to know his name. He worked for DDSN for, I think, 15 years in cost analysis and did the cost reports when he was here. Um, he retired and moved to Montana, I think is where he lives. And so he, he's contracting with us to help us develop our internal capability um, to, to start doing our own cost reports again. So this, one, it, this is a real big problem. I know y'all asked Kevin about, you know, internal audits role and knowing that these aren't being done and so forth. And I know it's been a big issue. Cost reports come up a lot, um, even with the public when they do public input. So I felt it was important that I bring y'all up to speed with where we are on the cost reports. Um, 
Um, does anybody have any questions for Chris on false reports? <clears throat> No, I don't have any more questions. That, I, that that that's nothing to vote on. We just we're just that's more information, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. So we'll move on <coughs> to the next item on the agenda: contracts over two hundred thousand. All right. This will require a motion um, to send to commission. We had two vendors, uh, two providers, both DSN boards that are filling a bunch of residential vacancies, which is good. Uh, you know, that our folks are getting the services that they need. Um, Abcock Center's contract, again, has several uh, residential vacancies. If you look at your packet, there's a schedule in here um, of $324,809. They're all residential. The only non-residential is actually a decrease for a band I person that's no longer served. And then under Tri Development Center, a total of 207,495. Again, all residential adjustments. And if you remember um, at the commission meeting, I gave you all the quarterly summary and I showed you kind of how the money sloshes around in the residential services. And there are negatives. You don't ask us to present to you amendments of negative amounts or negative amounts over 200. So, you know, when you aggregate what's going on, Overall, um, typically we're not really increasing a whole lot uh, in summary. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, ready to make a motion on accepting these uh, expenses? <coughs> okay, I'm, I make a motion. We accept we accept the um, contracts over two hundred thousand. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. So. For the record, this is just to bring it to the commission in November, but anyway. Right. So um, we've approved bringing the two uh, contracts over 200000 to the commission meeting this month. All right. Next item, um, Chief Financial Officer Report. Chris. All right, just a couple things. Uh, we have provider quarterly basic training that we do, um, and I invited all the commissioners to that as well. It's November 5th, which is what, Wednesday or Thursday? Um, 9 a.m. to noon. Um, we offer that through Skype, so if you're interested in attending that, I do think it'd be beneficial as a commissioner to hear that. Um, just let me know if you'd like to register. <clears throat> we'll be sure to get you the handouts and everything. Which one is this again, Chris? It's uh, the basic training. I think you've been, yeah, you may have been to it well. once. Yeah. Um, now, it's supposed to be static as to the topics, but since we're a changing agency, there are new things that come up in there because, just for example, we changed the environmental mods and the private vehicle mods in September, Debbie. And so, you know, we can't keep presenting the old... <laughs> So even if you've been to it, you might still get something out of it. Uh, also, um, Bambi and I, were making a lot of progress on that. Um, we should have a really good update for you all by the commission meeting. Um, I will try and get another update to you this week. We've been discussing internally a lot of different options as to how to migrate the water, or navigate these waters and, and get where we need to be. Um, so, um, January 1 still looking good. The, the biggest issue that's left to decide uh, for you all is, is, you know, how do you really want to roll this out? Because there's a host of options that we can consider. Um, some are really not viable at all, but they're still an option. Um, and then others are, are very viable. So, uh, we, we hope to have more information to you here soon. I didn't know if Pat or Mary wanted to comment on this part. Um, I want to get some provider input into this. We're working with a uh, group of providers um, to, as we, we um, would you have two meetings with them, right? Two so far, yes. To, to talk about their thoughts on um, how this would impact them. Right. To make sure that we had some of that input so we would develop an options that that was taken into consideration. You look like you. Um, just to. Just to um, 
complexity, a kind of a white paper with the options on it <coughs> to you in advance. So you have a scorecard and, and, and pull a lot of the thoughts together that we've been talking about for many months. And also make sure that we vet it one more time with the provider network before we come to you because your question to us is going to be, how does the provider network feel about it? So we have some time to do before the commission meeting, but I think we got plenty of time to button it down. Anything else, Chris? Um, I did, I want to pause for questions there. I had two more real quick updates. Barry, did you have any comments or questions on the BNI? Not Before at this I time. On. I'll just wait on y'all to. I'll wait on y'all to present, present something right. you know more specific. Right. I think. Okay. Um, I know Kevin presented or mentioned, I guess, in a prior meeting that he did an audit on um, SFH specialized family homes, and. Um, Special, is that right? Specialized? Okay. Didn't sound right when I said it. Um, we had a corrective action plan due to him by the end of October. That was submitted to him last week. I uh, would we'll be glad to share that with you. But in a nutshell, you know, it's an internal audit, not anything external. So um, we didn't provide that to you all, but it, it, we can. The primary issue is we just need to redo our solicitation and get all these problems fixed because there are a host of issues in that program. And the problem is when you've bid that out and you have a contractual obligation, it's hard to change the rules of the game in the middle of, you know, a contract period without creating liability issues and other problems. Um, so we're, we're on top of that. And then just to let you know, the state facilities meeting we had uh, got tabled, as, uh, as we told you, we've, we've uh, met with Ekstrom's office last week. Uh, he's requested a little bit of additional information, which we've already pulled together, getting that to him this week. So hopefully, um, my gut feel was, and Mary, you were in that meeting, that, that they would probably end up supporting this in the end. There's just a lot of, they didn't really understand kind of what, what was going on and why we were doing what we we're trying to do. Didn't you feel like he ended up? What, the? Uh, extra that he yeah, felt like he so. would support? I, I think he just didn't. Yeah, well, it was just a lot to contemplate. I, I don't think he had gone completely through that packet to see why we were doing what we were doing and that this whole process has been in place since 2016. And it's we're not getting a dollar amount for the land, but we're getting kind of a quid pro quo. If you get if we get you get the land and we're getting this infrastructure taken care of and it's it's a serious amount mm -hmm. of infrastructure. So I think once you understood well, that's Witt Center. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. No. Provider network. I'm but sorry. but yeah, Witt. But he, I didn't... he also had a lot of questions about Witt Center too. Right. The sheer number of acreage. Um, but the provider network, I don't think they were 100% sure as to why we are doing this. So that is something we're going to have to explain to them again. Yeah, and they just to be clear that information was required to be submitted a month in advance of the meeting. And it was. And it was to every member so you know they're busy just like you know others I mean he's the comptroller general so I mean he's got a yes, he's pretty got big him. job uh, so anyways I just want y'all to realize it's not because we didn't provide the data that well and all the pieces of the puzzle were in those packages um, we have not heard have we heard back from, from Will Smith's office yet no. No. we still have not heard from him so that was the other person who had questions, but we don't know what those questions are to help answer them for him. Okay. That was my update. As, as to the reason that we are um, allowing these 60 houses to go, go directly to the providers, is one of our, um, one of our arguments or, or one of our reasons because of liability, because they should be, um, that gets us out of a lot of liability if we if we put those name houses in their names, um, and so I'm just thinking that should be part of our argument as to why we want to do that. It ha it hasn't been, um, but that can certainly be expressed. I mean, I think I think Ekstrom's concern is, you know, what are these properties worth, and why are we giving them away? Um, as a state agency and what he, what the piece I don't think he really understands is the equity stuck in the DSN system period. They're not, whether we sell the property or whether a provider sells the property or uses it or doesn't use it, it's the same exact, it, there's no difference. So we've just kind of got to convince him of that. 
but yeah, even administrative effort, there's a lot of administrative effort that we're going to continue to have to maintain here as we op own that, those homes and they operate them. And I also want to recognize Mr. Miller for being on that call. Appreciate thank you. Thank you for attending. I think that helped to have your presence there. So. Um, and also, we've got some of these properties. I don't think they quite understand the location of the properties. That we've got a couple of, like, especially the admin building, is sitting right in the middle of a basically a DDS and a, a complex of buildings um, that the agency operates as far as um, their admin, their day program, houses. You know, it's not something that someone's going to buy, come in and buy an eight bedroom home there. That's not. It's not a marketable piece of property either, but it is useful to the person who's using it. Right. That makes sense. So didn't the state legislators tell us to um, sell these properties? I felt like there was a mandate for something that we had. No, and I felt like selling them, it was giving them to the providers that were using them. It, it, was, it was transferring, them, transferring into the providers' names. Yeah, that, was, that was in that report, I think. Right. right. So we outlined. So he, he we outlined that we're doing. We, what we're we doing. outlined that in the memo, and we sent him a copy of the report with the area highlighted that we were trying to comply with. So, um, okay. you know, I don't think he fully. I don't think that uh, he got the MO from whoever ordered that to us. I'm talking about the general. And so it pulls up uh, quite a few questions to him that he didn't have the answer for. I think maybe what we need to do is go back, uh, according to what uh, Commissioner Robin just said, kind of research and see instructed us to do that, get that to him so that it kind of uh, opened up a different door for him. And I'm sure he talked with, uh, with uh, Representative Earl Smith they, they, they do converse, so I think that that would help to kind of clear up if there's any fog in the air. I think that that would help to clear it up with him. He's an open-minded person. Yeah, we, we cited those two reports and we provided copies of the reports. He had the reports. Good. Um, again, the problem is if you don't take the time to, I mean, it was a packet, so I mean, if you're... <laughs> You know, you got to sit and invest the time yeah. into it. Well, can we do this then? Let's kind of look back through it, kind of use our highlighter so we can direct him to where the fire uh, started at. Right. We can. All righty. Um, Why don't we just go, go with what, see if they got any questions and go from there. We, it may just be a, it may be a mute. I mean, it may be just formality to get it done now. If he just has a, you know, if we can just answer a couple of questions and that'd be that. We still haven't heard from Representative Smith, right. and we need to, we need to um, we need to be able to find out what his questions are and get those answered. Yeah, I um, I got my father-in-law to give him a call. So, yeah. um, he actually called me late Friday afternoon. Okay. So I have a voicemail from him, and so I called him back. Or no, it was Thursday, and so I called him back and left a voicemail. He left his, both his phone number in itself. So we're just playing phone tag now, yeah, it sounds like. That's phone good. Phone. And Merle always have a lot of questions, so we got to be ready for it. Yep. Yeah. That was uh, Kimberly McLeod. She's our new legislative liaison and public information officer, if you if you all haven't met her. You will. Yeah. Once we get out of our whatever we're in. <laughs> okay. All right, that was my report. All right. So, um, can I get a motion to adjourn? Kevin might have. Oh, oh Kevin, Kevin, you got something? Not, not so fast. You got there. slided. Uh, oh, sorry. Wow. <laughs> sorry. 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 I know. No, you don't need to make it fast. You, you're not. <laughs> we've got. We've done good time. So, um, sorry. No. As okay. Chris mentioned specialized family homes. Uh, we just completed that. We got the corrective action plan. You will have that audit report to you before we meet next, and it will include management's corrective action plan or management's response in there. So you'll have that. So I just wanted to check with y'all right now. My plan for the commission meeting is we will open uh, the floor up for the specialized family home audit. Should you have any questions, like I said, you'll have the report. Okay. We'll go over peer review cost. Is there anything else in there that y'all want to?
y'all want to see at the commission meeting from audit? Um, I felt like there was one thing outstanding. I can't think. We have time to receive an email. Right. Now, okay. Just want to make sure we're any questions. Okay. Um, well, obviously the, peer, the the report was the other thing we're gonna we're gonna approve. That'd be three things, right? You mean the directive? The, I mean the directive. That'll come out of committee, I believe. Right. That'll come out of committee. This is just for a director of internal audit report. That policy will come out. Robin will cover that in her presentation. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. No, that sounds good. All right. So. Um, so. Okay. <laughs> All right, so moved. Okay. Can we get a second to adjourn? Barry, you want me to? Second, yes, 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 yes. All right, we stand adjourned at 4.15, I believe, 4.13. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Barry. Yeah.